Hi, I'm Russ of Aquarium X Pets, and today I'd like to talk about using two widely available species of beetle in bioactive setups. Isopods and springtails are some of the most popular arthropods for use in bioactive vivaria as cleanup crews and for good reason. However, beetles can make excellent biocustodians as well. The two species of beetle we'll talk about in cleanup crews are Zoophobus atratus, formerly Zoophobus morio, the larvae of which are known and sold as superworms, or morio worms, and Tenebrio molitor, the larvae of which are known and sold as mealworms. You may have heard the adult beetles of both of these species referred to as darkling beetles. This is correct, as they are darkling beetles, but the Tenebrionidae, or darkling beetle family, has over 20,000 species in it. So calling them darkling beetles isn't wrong, but it isn't very precise. First, let's talk about Tenebrio molitor, or the mealworm, in a cleanup crew. If you're looking for a cleanup crew in a setup that is too dry for isopods, this may be a good candidate. Both the larvae and the adult beetles can withstand fairly dry conditions as long as they have access to moist foods a few times a week, including, but not limited to, slices of carrot, potato, sweet potato, or apple. I've kept this species with my leopard gecko successfully, and at Clint's Reptile Room, I'm told that Tenebrio molitor served very well as a cleanup crew for Gus Gus, the Argentine tegu. Mealworms are, of course, extremely easy to obtain, as almost any pet store will offer them inexpensively, and they're also sold online. When sold in a pet store, they're usually sold refrigerated, which gives you an idea of how tolerant they are of a range of temperatures, though, of course, refrigeration inhibits growth and development of the larvae. Never buy a tub of mealworms without opening it first and taking a look at the mealworms themselves. You can dig gently into the bran, and most of them should move, even if they're a bit sluggish in the cold. If more than a few of them have blackened portions on their bodies, which indicates that they're dead, find a fresher tub. In addition to being cold, they're often somewhat dehydrated, so after you bring them home, but before you sift them out of the wheat bran they're usually sold in to add them to a bioactive setup, I highly recommend offering them some juicy foods, such as a slice of carrot or apple, over several days. This will allow them to hydrate before adding them to a cleanup crew. For some additional nutrients, you might want to offer them some flakes of oatmeal or a few pieces of dry dog food as well. Without the chance to refresh themselves after their stint in the refrigerator, you may find that many of them will die off quite quickly. When you add mealworms to an enclosure, especially in an enclosure with a reptile that is a potential predator, try covering them with leaf litter or a hide, just something so that they have a chance to become a cleanup crew instead of a short-lived snack. You might as well do the same even if they're in an enclosure where they're unlikely to be eaten, just to ease the acclimation process for them. While the larvae, or mealworms themselves, are attractive as snacks to a wide variety of reptiles, the beetles have a defense mechanism. They can release a repugnatorial fluid when bothered that makes them distasteful to many species. You may have noticed this smell lingering on your hands after handling an adult mealworm beetle. Despite the odor of this defensive fluid, some reptiles don't seem to notice it and will chomp them down quite happily. As part of a bioactive cleanup crew, in addition to the slices of vegetables I already mentioned, both mealworm beetles and their larvae will feed on many of the things that you would hope and expect them to eat, such as uneaten food, dead insects, uh, bits of shed skin, and even fecal material from your reptiles. Though they're not going to do much about the urates, which are the whitish portion of the solid waste, so you'll have to remove that yourself. If you have an omnivorous reptile, especially one that's a messy eater, you may never need to provide any additional food to your mealworm cleanup crew. If you have something like a snake, especially one that eats infrequently, it may be necessary to supplement their food with more of those vegetable slices that I mentioned, perhaps a few pieces of dry dog food here and there. As far as breeding is concerned, the mealworms may find that the substrate in your enclosure is a great place to pupate. This should be true as long as your substrate is deep enough, not too damp, not too dry, and your reptiles are not overly fond of digging up larvae and or eating the adult beetles. With such a substrate, you'll have pupation going on, you'll have beetles emerging from the substrate, and you'll have a self-perpetuating population of mealworm beetles in your bioactive setups. If you want to culture mealworms outside of a bioactive setup, 
as food for your pets or as a master culture from which you can periodically restock your bioactive vivariums, I have a video on that topic. It's a little old, and I tend to offer a more varied diet to my larvae and beetles now, but the method is easy and, as you'll see if you watch the video, quite effective. Before I move on to using the superworm as a cleanup crew member, I want to thank my patrons at Patreon.com. I'm really grateful for your support. One of the aspects of this hobby that I really appreciate is the sense of community, and Patreon is one of the ways to keep the community thriving. And a little goes a long way. For one US dollar or more per month, you can help me do what I love, share information about the creatures that we all love. If you'd like to help support Aquarimax Pets, please go to patreon.com and search for Aquarimax, or just click on the link at the end of the video or in the description. And now, let's take a look at Zoophobus atratus, the superworm or morio worm. The larvae look a lot like a giant mealworm, but in addition to the size difference, there are some other important distinctions. One is that as a tropical species, superworms are not nearly as cold tolerant as mealworms and will die if kept refrigerated for any length of time. Another is that they tend to do well in somewhat moister environments than mealworms. They can still tolerate dry conditions longer than isopods can, for example, and they can do fairly well in arid bioactive enclosures as long as they have access to sufficient moisture. But they'll also thrive in substrates and conditions that would be a little too moist for mealworms. They don't seem to do well in very moist, poorly ventilated conditions, though. They tend to be a bit faster moving than mealworms as well. Once again, don't buy a tub of superworms without inspecting it for dead specimens. Once you bring home a tub full of active, healthy larvae, feed them a bit of hydrating vegetable matter, and maybe some dried dog food or fish food pellets, something like that, right away. Once they've had a chance to eat that for a few days, they'll be ready to go into your enclosure. But if applicable, make sure to give them a chance to hide before being eaten by your reptile vivarium inhabitants. Again, some reptiles like my leopard gecko will happily munch on superworms, but completely ignore the beetles. Other individual leopard geckos, as well as other reptile and amphibian species, will gladly snack on the beetles as well. So their mileage as a biocustodial crew may vary. Superworms and their beetles will thrive on the same foods that mealworms eat, and whether this is due merely to their larger size or whether they're actually more voracious, they end up eating quite a bit more food. This makes them a very effective cleanup crew, and in some cases, you may find that you need to add supplemental food for them. I keep them in with my leopard gecko and frequently drop in bits of dried dog food, carrots, apples, bananas, etc. to keep the beetles well fed. They do an admirable job taking care of feces, though once again, I need to go in and remove urates manually. While most superworms are inhibited from pupating when kept in crowded conditions like any superworm culture, a nice deep bioactive substrate with a little moisture provides a perfect place for them to burrow and create their own little pupation chamber, so you'll likely find beetles emerging from the substrate after a while. The beetles are, unsurprisingly, much larger than mealworms and have proportionately longer legs. They are very active, and therefore, they add some visual interest to a vivarium. They're active all the time, too, so in an enclosure with a nocturnal species of reptile, you'll still have some activity during the day. They will begin to mate and lay eggs, and soon you should have a thriving biocustodial crew within your vivarium. Unless you have a reptile or other vivarium inhabitant that controls the population of these beetles in your setup through predation, you'll probably want to remove excess beetles now and then as too many beetles can be stressful for your reptiles and may even try to nibble on them if the beetles get extremely hungry. You can add the excess beetles to a bin with a few inches of substrate to begin to produce larvae for use as feeders and or to populate other setups. As always, make sure to do your research so that you know that these beetles are a good fit for the particular species and setup with your reptiles and amphibians that you're working with. These two species of beetle are definitely the most widely available in the hobby, but there are other beetle species that have their uses in bioactive setups. Have you kept these species or any other beetle species as biocustodians? If so, let me know all about it down in the comments. And thanks for watching. I post videos every Friday with live streams on Wednesdays, all about aquarium and vivarium pets with lots of arthropod content. Feel free to like, share, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then, Tap the bell for all notifications so you don't miss my next video.